Hey, crime connoisseurs. If you're like me, you love diving into a good book. I especially love finding a book about cases we cover. But sometimes it's hard to find the time to sit and read. We live in an on-the-go society. Thankfully, Audible makes it easy to instantly access the books we love without sacrificing our time. With over 180,000 audiobooks and more, you will undoubtedly find one that will grip you and leave you not wanting to pull away while still being able to do other things. You can get a free 30-day trial membership by going to audibletrial.com backslash ccpod to start listening to your favorite books. That's audibletrial.com backslash ccpod for your free 30-day trial membership. Hey, all my fellow crime connoisseurs. I'm your host, Grace D. And today we're going way back to the 1800s. When you think of the dictionary, two particular ones come to mind, the Merriam-Webster and the Oxford English Dictionaries. But what do you know about the people behind making them possible? In today's episode, we're going through the life of a man who was one of the main contributors to the Oxford English Dictionary, who also happened to be a schizophrenic murderer. This is the story of William Chester Minor. William Chester Minor, also known as W.C. Minor, was born on June 22, 1834. Minor was from a family of Connecticut aristocrats. In 1833, Minor's father, Eastman Minor, was a Congressionalist missionary and moved to Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, with his new bride, Lucy. Minor was their first child, and little is known about Minor's childhood except that he lost his mother to tuberculosis when he was only three years old. At the age of 14, Minor was sent back to the United States and lived with his uncle Alfred in New Haven, Connecticut, to attend New Haven's Russell Military Academy to complete his education. Minor went on to study medicine and anatomy at Yale University. Minor served as a battlefield surgeon in the Union Army when the U.S. Civil War began. In May 1864, Minor was stationed at the Battle of Wilderness in Locust Grove, Virginia, as a surgeon. This engagement is considered particularly brutal even by the standards of the American Civil War. The casualties were massive, and many men were killed not only by musketry and artillery, but also gruesomely by the wildfires that broke out in the undergrowth. As a surgeon in the field hospital, Minor witnessed many gruesome sights. Civil War dressing stations and field hospitals comprised little more than wooden tables and the back of a horse-drawn field ambulance. In 1864, Minor worked at the Knight General Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut, where he published a series of detailed accounts of post-mortem examinations that he had carried out. He also worked at the Louverture Hospital in Alexandria, Virginia, before moving to the Governor's Island, where he was eventually promoted to full captain in September 1866. However, it was not long before the first clouds of the mental turmoil that overshadowed his promising military career began to gather. Within a few years, Miner's bizarre behavior began to cause concern among his colleagues. He was working at the Governor's Island in New York, and he spent an excessive amount of his free time with sex workers. Consequently, the Army transferred him to Fort Barrancas in Florida because of this. After he was transferred, he began accusing his colleagues of plotting and conspiring against him. He had developed firmly and 
entrenched beliefs that an Irish secret society was persecuting him. There were also episodes of violent behavior around this time, and one in particular incident, Minor challenged a fellow officer to a duel. In September 1868, at age 34, Minor was examined by army doctors who found him to be delusional, violent, and homicidal. They diagnosed a condition then called monomania, resulting in his delusions, and recommended that he be admitted to the Government Hospital of the Insane in Washington, D.C., which later became St. Elizabeth's Asylum, which he entered voluntarily. In the spring of 1871, Minor was discharged from the Washington Asylum and retired from the Army. The doctors considered that his mental illness was rooted in his war service, and he was awarded an Army pension. Minor's family suggested that his mental health might benefit from some time spent traveling and thought that painting in England would do him good. Minor was an accomplished watercolorist. One of Minor's friends from Yale offered to put him in contact with John Ruskin, the celebrated English writer and art critic. But Minor likely had another purpose in mind when he came to England. Police Superintendent Williamson, who later gave evidence at Minor's trial, said that Minor told him he had come to England to escape persecution he believed he was the victim to in the U.S. However, Miner's hopes of escaping his terrors were soon dashed. While living at a hotel in central London, he once again became convinced that members of the Fenian Brotherhood who were pursuing him in America had now followed him to England. He was determined to defend himself from them, a resolution that was to end in tragedy. Minor moved to England, where he settled in Lambeth, just across the river from Britain's Parliament at Westminster. The area of Lambeth where Minor lived at the time could only be described as vile and impoverished. It was like a scene in Charles Dickens' book, Oliver Twist. It was a place of tanneries and tenements, blacking factories, soap boilers, dyes, and lime burners. It was the noisiest and most sulfurous district of a city notorious for its squalor, bluster, and dint. And that wasn't even the worst of it. At the time, the marsh was technically considered part of Surrey rather than the city. The area attracted all sorts of unsavory characters. Rookeries, brothels, and lewd theaters operated freely without fear of intervention from London's Metropolitan Police. Violence wasn't uncommon. However, gun violence was. At about 2 a.m. on Saturday, February 17, 1872, on a clear, starlit night with a bright moon, Miner shot George Merritt, a shift worker from the Lion Brewery in the street in Lambeth, a district of London. Miner and Merritt didn't know each other. After shooting Merritt, Miner continued to attack him with a bowie knife that he was carrying under his jacket, causing further and unnecessary injury. The gunshot wounds were already fatal, and Merritt died quickly. Miner was apprehended soon after by a patrolling police constable who disarmed him. While being questioned, Miner freely admitted to the officer that he had fired the three shots. The police constable sent Merritt to a nearby St. Thomas's Hospital. The house surgeon, Henry Williams, examined the casualty, and Merritt was pronounced dead. The surgeon found bullet wounds in his chest and neck and concluded, pending the autopsy, that they were the cause of death. Merritt left behind a pregnant widow and seven children. Minor was taken to the Tower Street Police Station, where he was searched. The Bowie knife he used was found. Miner told the police that he killed Merritt because he believed that he had broken into his room to poison him while he had been asleep. This particular delusion would plague Miner for the rest of his life. At times, he believed that abusers were trying to confuse and make him unaware by administering chloroform while he was asleep and then sexually abusing him. 
1877, he began to believe that he was being tortured with electricity during the night and was secretly removed from the asylum at the night to be abused. After Miner's arrest, police officers were sent to his home to search for evidence. Here, they found a letter explaining how Miner was discharged from the army because of a sunstroke that had affected his ability to practice as a doctor. They also found letters explaining that Miner had been advised by his friends to travel to England to recover his mind. Within the day, Miner was charged with the willful murder of Merritt and appeared at the Southwark Police Court, also known as the Magistrate's Court, for committal. The police constable who arrested Miner told the magistrate that when they arrested him, there was not the slightest sign of alcohol on him and that he did not resist arrest. Miner was then remanded in the custody of the horsemonger Ling Gull. William Carter, the coroner, convened an inquest on the following Monday, February 19th, and also returned a finding of willful murder. Miner was then held in custody and committed to the Surrey Assizes on the charge of willful murder before trial. After the committal hearing, several different explanations circulated in the local press regarding Miner's motives for the murder. One account given was that he had been robbed by a pimp and had mistaken merit for that pimp. Another explanation was that he was part of some inheritance scam involving another brewery employee. These stories likely arose from the press's natural desire to find some rational motive for the killing before the evidence of mental health became apparent to them. However, no evidence was found to support these theories. It was said that Miner left the hotel because he feared the staff there were in cahoots with the Fenian Brotherhood. Detective Williamson told the magistrate that Miner, quote, believed that his persecutors had followed him from America and that someone in the hotel where he was staying was in league with them, end quote. Minor was tried at Kingston Assizes before the Lord Chief Justice William Beauville. Edward Clark defended him on the instructions of the American Vice Council. The Honorable G. Denman Q.C. prosecuted, and was assisted by C.J. Matthew. The defense admitted the facts of the killing, but argued for an insanity verdict. Evidence was heard from the arresting and investigating police officers, the surgeon at St. Thomas's Hospital, a gunsmith, Miner's landlady, and Merritt's widow. The defense claimed that Miner's insanity had been caused by his experiences of warfare particularly an episode in which Miner had been required to brand a young Irish soldier in the face as punishment for desertion following the Battle of the Wilderness. It was claimed that Miner believed this man had been a secret society member whose members had been pursuing and persecuting him. It was also stated that Miner had had a bad episode of sunstroke while in the army, which had been thought to be the cause of his mental illness by some doctors in the United States. Detective Williamson from Scotland Yard testified that in the months before the killing, they had several approaches from Minor both by letter and in person in which he claimed that he was being persecuted by a conspiracy of Irishmen who were trying to poison him. He had concluded from this that Miner was suffering from delusions. Williamson added into evidence a letter he had received from Miner recently in which he said, quote, Sir, I was narcotized last night into a stupor from about two in the morning until one this afternoon. I suspect this was some attempt to take my life in ways that would not be apparent, either in some such way or by attempting to give it the color of a suicide. My life may be taken any night. You will assist in the matter. I shall be glad to do so. I trust your agents are not to be bought over, as American police have been by money. End quote. Uncover the secrets of your dog's DNA with Wisdom Panel. 
the world's leading canine genetics test. With a simple cheek swab, Wisdom Panel can reveal your dog's breed, ancestry, health traits, and so much more. Understanding your dog's genetic background can help you provide the best care possible. Whether it's identifying potential health risks, understanding their behavior, or simply satisfying your curiosity about your dog's unique heritage, Wisdom Panel delivers the insights you need. Their state-of-the-art technology analyzes over 350 breeds, types, and varieties, and screens for over 200 genetic health conditions. Plus, their easy-to-understand reports make it simple to learn about your dog's genetics. Join the millions of pet parents discovering their dog's story with Wisdom Panel. Order your kit today and start exploring your dog's DNA. Because every dog has a tail, and Wisdom Panel helps you tell it. Go to wisdompanel.pxf.io backslash ccpod to learn more about your four-legged friend. That's wisdompanel.pxf.io backslash ccpod. Williamson went on to say, quote, I asked him the particulars of the persecution, and he said that persons who were invisible to him came into his room in the nighttime, and he believed tried to poison him. And on his wakening in the morning, he had a burning sensation in his throat and tongue. End quote. A prison warder at the Remand Prison at Horsemonger Lane was called to give evidence of Minor's mental state and described how Minor would accuse him and the other guards of allowing him to be sexually abused in his cell at night. The prison doctor, Thomas Waterworth, testified that he believed Minor was insane when he was admitted to the prison, and still was. Miner's brother was also called to the witness box and testified that the delusions that were described to the court were similar to the ones that Miner had suffered while in America. He told the court that his brother had complained of prowlers in his room at night when he was living with the family during 1871 and that he had been so passionate about the issue that he had insisted that he sit up with him all night to try and catch them. Miner had also complained of being poisoned with a metallic substance during this time. Miner did not answer any questions in court, nor did he give any reason for killing Merritt. After hearing the witness testimonies and a brief summary by the Lord Chief Justice, the jury returned a special verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity, and Miner was ordered to be detained until Her Majesty's pleasure be known. Miner was classified as a criminal lunatic under the 1800 Act for the Safe Custody of Insane Persons Charged with Offenses, which gave rise to what subsequently became known as the Special Verdict of Not Guilty by Reason of Insanity, which applied in Miner's case. He was transferred to Broadmoor Asylum from the local prison on April 17, 1872. Despite the problems of bringing witnesses over from the U.S. to testify at his trial and obtaining the necessary expert testimony here. Just two months had elapsed since the killing of George Merritt to Miner's incarceration at Broadmoor. The Broadmoor Institution is situated in the village of Crawthorne in Berkshire, about 50 miles outside of London. It was built in 1863 to care for both male and female patients who began arriving in 1864. Broadmoor was intended to replace the accommodation for criminal lunatics, which formed part of the Bethlehem Asylum in South London and was widely acknowledged to be inadequate in terms of its size, the facilities, and the environment it provided. Broadmoor was seen as pioneering and represented fresh thinking regarding the care for the mentally ill. The environment was intended to be clean and wholesome, with access to open air and useful occupations like crafts, entertainment, and sports provided. And to an extent, this aim was successful. From the start of his time at Broadmoor, Miner was considered a low-risk patient and was given many privileges that were unavailable to other inmates. 
The U.S. consulate sent comforts such as clothes, drawing equipment, and food for Miner. And he also had the advantage of both a financial allowance from his family in the U.S. and his officer's pension from the Army. Miner was courteous and well-educated, and with his military background and pension, he was considered a gentleman. Miner was inmate 742, having not one but two rooms in the prison's swell block. According to one of the later superintendents of Broadmoor, in 1958, Dr. Patrick McGrath, at one point, Miner was given an adjacent cell to use as a day room and allowed to employ other patients as his domestic servants. Miner had an extensive library of antique books during his time in Broadmoor, and according to Simon Winchester, in his book The Meaning of Everything, Miner's tastes in reading tended to the obscure, the foreign, and the old. Miner's books were his most prized possessions. Over time, he had so many books that they were overflowing one of his rooms. Miner had spent more than eight years at Broadmoor, and his mental health continued to decline. One of his doctors wrote, quote, There can be no doubt that Dr. Miner, though calm and collected at times, is absolutely insane and shows himself to be more so than he was some years ago. He has the calm and firm conviction that he is almost nightly the victim of torment and purposive annoyance on the parts of the attendants and others connected with an infernal criminal scheme, end quote. It's thought that this activity brought him into contact with the public appeal by James Murray, the lexicologist asking for volunteers to help contribute suggestions for a new publication called the Oxford English Dictionary. In the 1840s, a small group of intellectuals in London expressed dissatisfaction with the existing dictionaries of the English language available. It set into motion a project to produce a definitive work. However, the scope of work was very significant. So, during the 1870s, Oxford University agreed to publish the work under the leadership of James Murray. The project was expected to take seven years to complete and be about 7,000 pages long in four volumes. In fact, the first edition was published in 1928. It actually ran 12 volumes with 414,825 words defined and 1,827,306 citations employed to illustrate their meanings. Dr. William Chester Minor was one of the earliest and most prolific contributors. He started collecting quotations around 1880 to 1882 and continued doing so for 20 years, working through his library. This work became a defining moment in Minor's life. Minor made an enormous contribution to the dictionary, and it didn't go unnoticed. Murray had the idea of issuing a public appeal for volunteer readers who could read widely and then refer to the dictionary staff examples of the usages of words and their contexts. In addition to his work on the dictionary, Minor was also allowed to paint and play his flute. Minor always signed his letters Broadmoor, Crawthorne, Berkshire. His identity remained a mystery to his unseen colleagues working on the project, and Murray and Minor didn't meet for many years. When Minor failed to respond to an invitation to attend the Great Dictionary Dinner in 1891, Murray decided to visit Minor to find out who this mysterious man was. Murray arrived at a large Victorian mansion, believing this to be the home of Minor, a typical country gentleman. What he didn't know was that it was actually the administration building for Broadmoor. When Murray was shown into the study of the asylum's director, he naturally believed him to be the evasive Dr. Minor. Only then did he learn that Minor was an asylum inmate. Over the following 20 years, Minor worked assiduously on the Oxford English Dictionary contributions while at Broadmoor and was ultimately considered one of the significant contributors to the work. 
A quotation from Murray reproduced in an article in The Nation gives insight into the diligence and energy with which Minor approached this work. Quote, The supreme position is certainly held by Dr. W.C. Minor of Broadmoor, who during the past two years has sent in no less than 12,000 quotes. So enormous have been Dr. Minor's contributions during the past 17 or 18 years that we could easily illustrate the last four centuries from his quotations alone. End quote. Winchester says that Minor's story is one of dangerous madness, ineluctable sadness, and ultimate redemption. Redemption because he found in his work for the dictionary a form of therapy which made his tortured life a little more bearable, perhaps. Miner's work on the dictionary is a testament to the exceptionally beneficial effect a useful occupation can have on people with schizophrenia. An occupation was an intrinsic part of the Victorians' thinking here. Most of the asylums built by the Victorians during that age for people with mental illness had accompanying farms and sheltered workshops, which provided highly effective in reducing symptoms. Despite his work on the Oxford Dictionary, Miner's mental turmoil provided to be relentless, and he continued to suffer from delusions and hallucinations throughout his stay in Broadmoor. This was the time before the effective antipsychotic medicines that we have today. A look at some of Miner's notes reported in Simon Winchester's book gives some insights into his dilemma. Quote, April 1873. At night, he barricades the door of his room with furniture. June 1875. The doctor is convinced that intruders manage to get in from under the floor or through the windows and that they pour poison into his mouth through a funnel, end quote. Despite the undoubted fact that Miner could think and act lucidly enough to carry on his valuable work for the Oxford Dictionary, his psychotic symptoms never really diminished during his time in Broadmoor. Miner's family started to make efforts to secure his discharge from Broadmoor, a cause which the asylum authorities were sympathetic to, as they were becoming increasingly concerned about his ability to look after himself within the asylum environment. His general physical health was also worsening. He suffered from a severe case of the flu and very badly scalded himself while bathing. Miner's family petitioned the Home Office for his release in 1899, but were unsuccessful. In 1903, they tried again, this time at the instigation of Dr. Brain, the Broadmoor superintendent, who suggested that he might be discharged to return to America. This found a more sympathetic ear in the government of the day and the then Home Secretary, Winston Churchill, and they issued the discharge and deportation order. In 1910, Minor finally left England by steamship in the care of his brother, bound for America. He had been confined in Broadmoor for 29 years. On his return to the U.S., Minor was readmitted to St. Elizabeth's Asylum, where he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He remained there until November 1919, when he went to live at the Retreat for the Elderly Insane in Hartford, Connecticut. Dr. William Chester Minor passed away peacefully on March 26, 1920, at 85, following a head cold that became pneumonia. Minor's story was depicted in the book The Surgeon of Crawthorn by Simon Winchester, which explores his life, mental illness, and role in creating the Oxford Dictionary. The book was later adapted into the film titled The Professor and the Madman in 2019, starring Mel Gibson and Sean Penn. William Chester Minor was an enigmatic figure in the annals of history. He was a man whose brilliance and tragic descent into madness captivated the world. William Chester Minor was an enigmatic figure in the annals of history. He was a man whose brilliance and tragic descent into madness captivated the world. 
By examining Miner's life, we gain insight into the complexities of human potential and the enduring power of the human spirit. Tragically, Miner's mental health deteriorated over time, leading to his eventual confinement in the Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic Asylum. Suffering from paranoid delusions, he believed he was being pursued by Irishmen who sought to harm him. His mental illness, likely exacerbated by the horrors he witnessed during the war, isolated him from society and plunged him into a world of darkness. Miner's delusions led him to commit a heinous crime, mistakenly believing he was defending himself against one of his perceived tormentors, resulting in his institutionalization forever altering the trajectory of his life. We must not allow our understandable sympathy for Minor to cloud the grievous tragedy of the loss of George Merritt. Still, it is crucial that we also learn to blame the illness rather than the person for these tragedies. Schizophrenia is a unique condition in this respect, that an episode of schizophrenia will all too often create a whole number of victims around the central one who is, of course, the sufferer themselves. William Chester Miner's life was a testament to the complexities of the human mind and the indomitable spirit that can persist even in the face of adversity. His intellectual brilliance, tragically overshadowed by his descent into madness, left an enduring legacy in the world of lexicography. Miner's contributions to the Oxford Dictionary serve as a reminder that human potential can transcend the confines of mental illness, inspiring generations to appreciate the power of language and the resilience of human spirit. And that's the case of Dr. William Chester Miner. I hope you guys enjoyed traveling back through the 1800s with me on this one. When I learned of Minor and his intellectualness, that he was also in an insane asylum for schizophrenia and had committed a murder, I just felt that this was a different story to be able to tell for you guys. One that we can look back on, learn from, and be able to sympathize with the victims but also with those who are suffering from mental illnesses of schizophrenia that cause them to have actions and behaviors the way that Minor had. So, you know the deal. Be sure to follow on Instagram and subscribe to Crime Connoisseurs wherever you get your podcast. In the meantime, keep it classy, connoisseurs, and I'll catch you on the next case. Are you tired of settling for subpar cat food? It's time to upgrade your cat's dining experience with Smalls, the ultimate gourmet meal for your feline companion. Say goodbye to generic one-size-fits-all cat food. With Smalls, you can rest assured that your furry friend is getting the nutrition they deserve. Join the thousands of cat owners who have made the switch to Smalls and see the difference it can make in your cat's health and happiness. Treat your cat to the finest dining experience with Smalls. Visit smalls.sjv.io backslash ccpod now to order your first box. That's smalls.sjv.io backslash ccpod. Choose Smalls because your cat deserves the best.